no damn good luck when you're turning your back on the mother continent? How the hell are you gonna have good luck with a trillion, billion, a trillion dollars in spending power? You're the richest group of blacks on the face of the earth. The 10th richest group in the whole world. But you won't use none of that money to uplift your race or your motherland. That's why we're going to be for South Carolina, because we're going to talk about it. This ain't going to be no lecture fest. I want dialogue, because I'm no smaller than any one of you. And when we build that Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Pan-African School, I want your opinion, because despite my expertise, a million minds is still better than the best mind. So we're going to come as equals. No one being better than anybody else, and we're going to hammer this whole damn thing out, y'all. I think we owe our children that much. His Majesty, Conquering Lion of Judah, King of Kings, Emperor Haile Selassie. He give us rule number one, use the enemy against each other. The Italians decided that they wanted a piece of Africa. Mussolini said, I want that one country that's never been conquered. I want that one country that's never been colonized. So he sent his troops into Ethiopia. And brothers and sisters stood up in Ethiopia to fight that war. And many of your ancestors from America begged the United States government to let them go and fight for Abyssinia. That's right. Black men and women in America said, let me go home and defend mine because I'm damn tired of defending yours. The United States government said, you can't go. His Majesty said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go take a trip to the League of Nations and tell them that they best get Italy outside of my country. And the Ethiopian administrator said, Your Majesty, do you sure you want to go and ask white folks to deal with white folks? And His Majesty was shocked. He said, I'm going to use their own self-interest against themselves. So when he got to the League of Nations, he sat down with Britain and representatives from the United States and France and Portugal, and he said, y'all need to come and get rid of your trouble. And they said, that ain't our trouble, that's your trouble. Why should we get rid of a colonizer when we've colonized 85% of the world? We're sympathetic to what Mussolini is doing. And His Majesty and all his brilliance said, I just got one thing to say before I leave, gentlemen. If he takes Ethiopia, you'll be next. Have a nice day. A hundred pounds soaking wet. His Majesty strolled out. They said, come on back here for a moment. They start scratching their heads and says, you know what? He got a point there. If we let him get a foothold in Ethiopia, that will also give the Germans a foothold in Africa. That will put them right under the bottom of Europe. And they will be able to fight on higher ground. He's right. If Ethiopia goes, so goes our interest. And so the League of Nations dispatched their warriors and they lined up. But keep in mind, make no mistake, it was the Ethiopian warriors who was our first defending the continent. Not those Europeans. But because His Majesty effectively employed rule number one, use the European against the European, he was able to get Mussolini the hell out of Ethiopia. But this rule is very sensitive, black people. Because white folks are not as divided as we are, you must use this very, very selectively. Because if you choose a white person to use against another white person, you can never be sure if they will betray you. So rule number one is only to be used when you're absolutely certain that you have to, and that you know it will work. Keep your troops faithful. You can say whatever you want to say about Idi Amin, but Idi Amin was a Pan-Africanist. He was a friend of his majesty, and he didn't give a damn about no cracker. One thing I like about Idi Amin is whenever the European diplomats came to Uganda and got off the plane, Idi Amin would make them bow on both knees. He said, I'm the king of Uganda, you bow before you talk to me. That's right. And when the East Indians didn't want to Put none of the money that they was making in Uganda back into the economy. Idi Amin said, we ain't gonna be diplomatic. Get the F out of my country. <laughs> say what you want to say about Idi Amin, but one thing he wasn't was afraid of white people. Are y'all following me? Strategy number two. We know how quickly black people can turn against other black people, don't we? Idi Amin made it his business to make sure that his soldiers always ate before he did. He made it his business to make sure that if somebody in his soldier's family died or was ill, he would personally pay a visit, a visit to that soldier's family. He took care of his soldiers better than he took care of himself because he knew that his life or death lay in his soldier's hands. But how many of us in our organizations look down on the people who serve us? Look down on our secretaries. Look down on our vice presidents. Look down on our right-hand men and women. You better watch it 
Because those same people who you are taking for granted, the cracker will take and use them against you. Remember rule number two. Always keep the troops faith. The troops faith. Rule number three. Come from one of the greatest black men to ever live. Of course, this is an image of Henry C. who played Shaka Kassensi Kakoni. I had the opportunity to visit King Shaka's grave in 2005. I met with some of his grandsons. Went to the Shaka Zulu Museum. This black man who lived at the same time of Frederick Douglass with spears, but not with guns, brothers and sisters, never had to fight the British. <laughs> Why did the British never stand up to Shaka? They had guns, tanks, cannons, because Shaka Zulu scared the shit out of them. <laughs> That's rule number three. Are y'all with me? The first time they sent white men to KwaZulu to talk with Shaka, they said black men came out of the ground and all they could feel was somebody pulling on their feet and before you know it, they wasn't breathing no more. Shaka Zulu is the inventor of guerrilla warfare, the art of losing without seeing. The white man keep making you think that Shaka Zulu was some great tyrant. King Shaka was no tyrant. The reason why he conquered all the neighboring nations in South Africa is because he knew that the white man was coming. And he went to all the kings and queens and said, you gotta join forces so we can be strong. And they said, we don't care about you Zulus, you're powerless. So Shaka said, guess what, you gonna get down or lay down? <laughs> Shaka made them come into the Zulu kingdom to fight off the white man. And the white man was so scared, so afraid that he never had to fight him. The Zulu wars lasted almost 100 years. They didn't take Zulu land until Shaka's nephew was in charge. And even he stood up and fight the crack. That's right. Shaka Zulu was one hell of a man. You need to study him. Not the movie. Not the movie. Yeah. Stop trying to get your history from books. Because you're being misled. Read the books on Shaka. Brother Omar. Yes. John, the great John Henry Clark, he did a, a breakdown of the movie with uh, Shaka Zulu. He did all the corrections there. He, he had the DVDs out and he, he also called all the African warrior Zulu beside Chaka Zulu and he corrected all that garbage in the movie. Excellent. Thank you for that, beloved. Rule number four, Emperor Menelik II of Ethiopia used the Europeans' arrogance against them. The Battle of Adwa, 1896. This is the first time the Italians came in. The other European nations dispatched dignitaries to Menelik II descendant of King Solomon and Queen Sheba, and they said, you don't want to fight this war. They have superior weapons. They got superior machinery, superior artillery. And the the second said, get the hell out of my face. And he drew up the battle plan, which is in the National Museum in Ethiopia right now. The battle plan. And he mounted his horse, and his queen rode with him into battle. Some of the soldiers didn't understand. They said, Emperor Menelik, your highness, your majesty, why are you letting your empress ride with you into battle? Can't she be harmed? He said, if I die, I'd like to die with my queen, as opposed to leave her behind to be the slave of a devil. Are y'all following me?